So what are the options that you have for acquiring data from experiments? I brought an example here, which is a freeform composite, which is injection molded. And the problem was here, there's residual strain with an unknown distribution. To get these residual strains measured, we do a measurement using saw notching and relieve the strain in this experiment. Now you could opt for having single points measured uh, by using a set of strain gauges. As you see here on the right, we have applied a set of three rosettes, which on this component just above the saw cut will give you a line of points, one each for each direction um, of a strain gauge. Of course, you can get a pretty good impression on how the strain uh, evolves when releasing through the material, but it's not the complete picture. So what you would actually like to have is a um, data field. I highlighted on the graph in blue uh, a load step for the saw notch, and we did the same measurement, but instead of using strain gauges, we use speckle pattern interferometry. So you end up with a set of images representing the strain components in X, in Y, and in X, Y cross-direction. And you see pretty good there is um, a field of strains rather than points of strains. And you can also see whether you have glued the strain gauges on the right positions. Of course, instead of using speckle pattern interferometry, you can also use other full field techniques such as digital image correlation, fringe projection, or thermal stress analysis for getting shape, deformation, or strain or stress values. Why is calibration important? So there are several reasons for that. First, calibration is a proof of competence. If you think of the ISO guide 17025, which describes the general requirements for the competence of testing and calibration labs, um, this is actually applicable to all organizations that perform tests and, of course, calibrations as well. And this guide actually tells you that you should use appropriate procedures, you should estimate the measurement uncertainty, and you should calibrate all test equipment before putting them into service. Calibration leads to improved data quality because during a calibration procedure you can um, see or reveal experimental issues which you have not thought of when setting up the experiment. These could include the boundary conditions which are not properly set or the determination of a calibration factor which was chosen wrong. So uh, once you have performed a successful calibration, this also increases the confidence you have in your measurement result. And the final point here is international comparability. So because calibration per definition establishes a relation between the quantity values provided by a measurement standard and the corresponding indications of your measurement or your test equipment, uh, both, of course, coming with their associated measurement uncertainty, uh, allows you to compare your results to an international recognized standard. And if you do an unbroken chain of such comparisons or calibrations as it is, this establishes traceability to a primarily internationally recognized standard. What procedures are there available for calibration? Well, as you have seen, we are talking about full field measurements, so we need full field calibration to be addressed. And if you do a full field calibration, the first thing you need is a field of reference values rather than a single one. Reference materials as such and the methodology for their use are a preferred way for calibration. And the calibration procedure must include a methodology for comparing full field data from the measurement system 
and the measurement standard or reference material. And it needs an expression for uncertainty values related to this comparison. These are two exemplars of how to provide a field of reference values. On the left you see a reference material for static in-plane strain fields, whereas on the right you see a reference material that can be used in static, but also in dynamic in-plane strain field and out-of-plane deformation. The idea behind is that you express your displacement value, W, or strain value, epsilon, as a function of x and y across the gauge area, and you relate those to a simple factor of nu naught or w naught, which is the measured displacement of the top on the left or the measured displacement on the tip on the right, relating it to a field of values f of x and y, describing the strain or deformation, and on the right you also have a sinusoidal term for the dynamic use of this material. This is how the measurement values would look like. On the left you see strain field from a thermoelastic measurement. On the right you see a deflection field pattern in dynamic loading from a speckle pattern interferometer. You see the strain and displacement values are quite simple and can be described by a simple function f of x and y which is given analytically. Comparing these measured values to the reference values uh, sets the reference material in relation to your measurements and actually is giving you the calibration of your instrument. The flowchart I'm showing here is actually relating these things and can be found in the CWA, the SEN Workshop Agreement 71, which was part of the Vanessa project.